Okay, well, welcome to today's Thriving as an Expat webinar. My name is Michelle Rapp. I am the Associate Director of Alumni Career Strategy in the Office of Alumni Relations at Northeastern. And my job is to organize career programs and services for our diverse alumni of all ages and backgrounds. And I'm always interested in any ideas you may have of what would be helpful. But today, you know, as Northeastern continues to grow in its in its global scope and its emphasis on being a global university. It seems perfect to have Christine Marie Lunardelli here with us today, calling in from Switzerland, in fact, our first international presenter for a webinar, um, to talk about this topic of thriving as an expat. So let me tell you a little bit about her background. Christine Marie Lunardelli has extensive international experience as a brand marketing manager in the pharmaceutical, medical, and healthcare sectors. Her purpose is to help companies achieve results and deliver better solutions to improve patients' quality of life. She has lived and worked in Italy, Germany, and now Switzerland, and completed her master's in international economics and management at Sta Bocconi University in Milan. In addition, she has a BS in speech communications from Emerson College and an associate's degree in marketing from Northeastern. While working in global strategic marketing in Europe, she successfully managed product portfolios valued from 80 to 450 million euros and worked as a consultant and interim manager at various companies. Christine is adept at identifying key business opportunities internationally driving strategic initiatives and marketing tactics across markets, and collaborating and leading cross-functional and cross-cultural teams to deliver results. We're excited today to learn from her experience as well as her advice about being an expat. Thank you, Christine. Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, firstly, welcome everybody, and I want to thank Michelle Rapp for the opportunity to speak with all of you today and the nice introduction. Um, I really appreciate your interest, so thanks. Um, it's interesting because when Michelle mentioned during one of our conversations that she wanted to do something different with the NU Educational Web Series, she had the idea of sharing an expat journey, and she asked me if I would be interested. And of course I said yes, and I was very excited, um, especially as a very proud Northeastern alumna. So um, I want to, to say to all of you that I've clearly thrived as an expat. Um, it's moved my career forward and um, it's one of the best things that I ever did in my life. And um, I will say that it's something I wouldn't trade for the world and I'm sure other expats and compatriots would agree with me. Um, it's not, um, I believe it's, it's hard to convey an experience to those who haven't really experienced it themselves. So what I'm gonna to try to do today with you is give you a feel or a taste of my experience and maybe some insights, um, especially regarding culture and job strategies if you're thinking about looking um, outside of your um, native country. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Christine Marie Lunardelli as um, Michelle pointed out. And no, I'm not married to an Italian. And that's my real name. <laughs> and I get this often abro um, abroad by some of the women. I'm an American Italian. As Michelle mentioned, I'm currently living in Basel, Switzerland, and I work international as a marketer. Um, and this is my passion because I really like to help companies deliver better solutions to improve the quality of life of patients. And this is pretty much a, met, a mission in the healthcare industry. Um, I would like to start by um, sharing some statistics regarding employees sent overseas. And this is really interesting. Um, of all employees sent overseas, between 10 and 20% return home early. And this is either because they or their family could not adjust to the host country. It's not because they were not good at what they do. Um, another 30 to 35% sent overseas um, that stay in the country work well below their level of performance in respect to their home country. Um, some statistics with women. So women sent overseas are usually in the single digits. 
Um, their profiles are generally middle managers with only one in four making it to top executive status compared to 45% of their male counterparts. And we can contribute a little bit this to the glass ceiling effect and of course for other reasons. Um, what's often not mentioned or not told to employees sent overseas is that if they choose to do everything at their foreign assignment exactly as they've done at home, they will surely fail in their new assignment. Um, once upon a time, and in many cases still today, traditional expats were top performers at companies. I mean, they were selected for overseas assignments as a reward or a bonus for their performance and contributions to the company. I mean, these sign assignments generally ranged anywhere from one to three years. I mean, today, the international managers, they come in many shapes and forms beyond the traditional um, expat. And you can see the list there. There's shorter term assignments, project work, and virtual international teams, in betweenies whose spouses um, will go if the company will find them a job, female executives with trailing husbands, and over 50s who, who are willing to travel, leaving grown up children behind. And then, of course, education. Um, also, the younger generation, I want to point out, um, younger generation of executives structure their career differently today, and they take more risks. Um, they seek diversity, and they don't follow the traditional path of staying along to the same company. They seek challenges, including an international assignment, and I see this happen, happening quite often. I wanted to ask, you know, we have a, a nice intimate group here. Um, how many of you are considering an expat career? And maybe in the chat you could mention yes, no, or are you currently living an expat? I took a, uh, a few minutes maybe to, to see if a few people could respond. And you can access the chat menu from the lower right-hand purple arrow, and it'll you'll see the little... Uh, chat bubble to get to that menu. I see a couple of yeses. Great. I want to say that if you are looking to further your career um, or hold a leadership position, some global experience will be required, and it's a given even if it's a minimum experience, like working on a global team remotely. Because even if you're, re you're working on a, a global team remotely, you'll be required to travel and you know, interact with the, you know, the players abroad. So this is a very important aspect. Another thing I want to share with you is that um, I don't know if most of you are familiar, but in 2019, there was the new HSPC's expat survey, which is done every year. And this provides a ranking of the best places or countries to live, live and uh, work in. And um, I think this is interesting because if you're targeting, you know, working outside the native country and there's certain um, characteristics you're looking for, it could be interesting to check this out. Um, it's called the expat in Explorer survey and it's a global survey it's completed this year was by 18,000 expats across the world um, the research was conducted online by YouGov it was done in March and April 2019 and generally they calculate uh, the responses to 27 questions and it was uh, Switzerland came out first for the best countries to live and work and also you can see the US is number 23 and Actually, Italy joined the, the list at 28. So um, I just want to say that I've had a rich work experience both in the US and in Europe, and it's been very different, both experiences. And my journey starts, and I want to tell you a little bit about myself because my US experience was also important for my European. Um, a little bit about me is I was born and raised in New Jersey, in U.S., um, about 35 minutes from New York to a working class, middle, uh, middle class working family. 
Um, I'm the eldest of two siblings. Um, growing up, my family could not afford to put me through school, so I worked full-time and part-time, and with the help of an academic scholarship, completed my education. Um, as Michelle mentioned, um, I have my uh, degree from Northeastern in Business Administration Marketing, and I have a degree from Emerson College Bachelor in Science um, in Speech Communications. In the 80s, I went to work for a niche dental company, and I did well there. I had four promotions within five years. I was their customer service manager. At the time, I decided my interest was more in the medical arena, so I went to work for a top employer in the pharmaceutical sector in sales. And there, I managed a Boston territory worth almost two million. And this was working with partners, launched products. I was ranked 10 out of 130 for my success in that role. And I want to share this because, um, you know, when I was there, I was always very active with the community, volunteering, different associations. And in 1995, I met Boston's international community. And in 1996, I knew that I wanted to live in Europe. So I transitioned from the Boston area to Milan, Italy, and I began studying at Stabacone. School of Management. Um, I have my master's, as um, again Michelle mentioned, International Economics and Management from there. And you can see in the corner right part is a little postcard, um, which I always smile when I see because I worked with a graphic on that. The World Wide Web was not, um, it was slowly evolving. There was not social media. Um, so an illustrator did, was not in existence. So. Um, but anyways, it was interesting. Um, what prompted my decision? And this starts with objectives. And I wanted to share some of travel objectives with you because for me, it was advancing my career. I also wanted an international experience. Um, I saw everything going global. Um, if you look at these travel uh, objectives, which they're um, advancement in career, um, challenge, challenge assignment overseas, desire to get away from the U.S., need for a change, desire to keep up with colleagues and friends overseas, desire to get away from something personal or professional in life. There's a number of objectives. Um, research shows that it is important to have positive objectives if you're thinking about going overseas. Um, if you have negative objectives, your journey most likely will be negative, and this is shown by research. So I wanted to share that. My, um, my expat journey, there's Milan, and there's my graduating class from Stabacone. Um, we were 40 uh, students from 20 countries. This is before and after. Um, we actually had our 20-year um, reunion. Uh, a few years ago. So um, I wanted to say my expat journey continues in Italy, where I landed a role with an Italian consulting company located in Milan, and I worked for them on various projects, always in the pharmaceutical and healthcare sectors. And this was a fantastic course in international business. Um, I really got to know the Italian market, dynamics, players, um, the projects were diverse and gave me the opportunity to add value, building on my current skills. Um, in my assignments, I've all tried to stretch my capabilities with more responsibility, developing newer skills. And I have to add that when I went abroad, um, I had sponsors to work. So the first three years, um, I had sponsors. And it was um, actually a very dear friend of mine who's a lawyer suggested that I check to see if I qualified for an Italian passport. And I discovered, thanks to my grandfather, um, I could have an Italian passport. So I have dual citizenship, which makes working abroad much easier. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, from Milan, I went to Switzerland. I went to work for a Belgian company, and this was my first real European international experience. And it was really a break for me to work in terminal, um, where I was responsible as a manager for new projects in the respiratory area. 
And this was interesting because I recall my interview and my meeting with the CEO at the time and how he was emphasizing to create an international team. So by putting me, an American, with a Belgian-French team, we would become more international. Um, I later discovered that not only would the team become more international because of my American, but um, there was a strategic motive for my existence on the team, and that um, would be working with a U.S. arm of the company, prioritizing some of their in-development projects as their core team member marketing. Um, I was later handpicked out of a marketing team to head their communication strategy in Europe, so um, for one of their key products in a niche segment. And this arose due to the popularity of one of my company workshops um, that was well attended by countries and salespeople. Um, I did well there. I loved working with the countries. Um, however, the company um, didn't have the growth I was looking for. So I went to work for a top uh, company in Berlin, Germany, and transitioned from Switzerland to Germany. So in the upper right corner of the slide, you'll see Berlin. And it was a nice transition, um, more responsibility, managing a portfolio worth over 450 million in a therapeutic area that I was previously working in, I had experience. Berlin was a fantastic city where you could really see um, the German history, the culture, I absolutely loved it. Um, the portfolio was managing um, that I was managing had responsibilities of commercialized products. So I continued working with the countries um, on, a, on a global level. And I also managed some of their in-development projects as core team member. Um, I led cross-functional teams of more than 10 people um, in their strategic decision making. And I collaborated at all levels of the organization. Um, it was really a great role that I really enjoyed and I learned a great deal from. In 2002 and 2006, um, Europe went through a really rough time. And we, we can talk about the Great Recession of the 2000s um, as it was the, the first time, you know, I really felt challenged living in Europe. And the shocks from the U.S. always come to Europe. So... But in any case, the, the company I was working for, it went through a reorganization during a time of high unemployment that was really unconceivable. And I started doing multiple consulting projects with people I had long-term relationships with. And I can't emphasize enough how important relationships are. Um, I recently attended an event with one of the women's associations I belong to here in Basel, and it was on diversity. And in Switzerland, um, you know, it really, really hit me, hit home when one of the speakers commented and said, nothing is achieved by you alone. I mean, your networks and your relationships will be the key to your success. And I, I really couldn't agree more with her. Um, I eventually um, returned back to Italy and I landed a role with an Italian pharma company, family owned in Tuscany, um, beautiful, um, to run their strategic and commercial marketing and to manage their pan-European partners. And it was an excellent experience where I really did well and I really saw my skills coming together. I mean, managing challenges, fast decision making, which is really required here, turning sales numbers around, really adding value to the company. And I was successful there. I transitioned into doing more projects until I went to work for a U.S. medical affiliate. Um, I was the country marketing manager in Italy, um, leading an Italian team in a successful product launch. And so I've been working on a national level as well as an international level. And at the time, I was in discussions with people that I knew in the industry, and we created our own company. And we started to work with companies, and this was a great experience because it allowed me to touch multiple companies, and I continue to do so. Um, however, I began to get tired of not seeing projects from start to finish. So I took a job um, as a brand marketing manager, and I returned to Switzerland. And um, I have to say that um, it was really 
um, one of the best decisions that I've made. Um, I'm speaking a lot about, you know, the work life. Um, and work life is important, but also the life after work. And I think that, you know, having an overseas um, experience, you know, living out of your country, and this is something that I never left in the U.S. because I'm a very social person. And um, I, I continued my journey. Um, and I think it's important to have volunteer experience. I'm a runner. Um, there is always events in the different country for expats. And, you know, this is, you know, important. So I wanted to share that as well. Um, some of my takeaways, you know, Persistence and passion prevail. It really does. Um, if you don't learn, you won't grow. And if you don't grow, you'll never progress. Um, and this is very important just to keep going. Um, go with your gut and there are no wrong paths. I mean, the journey is yours and I suggest not to let anybody define that for you. Um, failure, no such thing. I mean, I look at um, it's a result that just is trying to, to move you in another direction. It's like a nudge. So um, these are some takeaways. When I look at skills that make the difference, you know, and this is taken, and I, I have resources listed at the end of this talk, um, but there is a, um, an important resource. It's called Survival Kit for Overseas Living. It's really geared toward Americans moving abroad, but also good for um, if you're living out of your um, native country, because there's always some take takeaways. Skills that make a difference um, are listed, and you can see some highlighted. Those were three of the key top skills um, that, that were important. I also want to say that if you were to rate yourself, I mean, there's a little test that you can do to see if you would prepare, you know, would be prepared to be overseas. And um, if you were to rate each of these skills on a scale of one to five, five being the highest, and you sum up your total, if you arrive at 55 plus, you're okay for an, an experience abroad. If you're under, you have a little work to do. So there's some train of thought there. I wanted to, to also share with you some positive career effects of a survey, or I should say 45 um, international managers were interviewed. 82% um, of the managers had a positive career effect. And um, some of them uh, reported faster professional development, more responsibility, autonomy, senior roles, more marketability. And they also looked at some of specific abilities, which were cross-cultural management, international skills, strategic thinking, negotiation, flexibility. Also some aspects of personality um, that were looked at, for example, like faster decision making I mentioned, better listening ability, greater sensitivity to other cultures, you know, a higher degree of independence. So, um, you know, there's clearly advantages, you know, to going abroad. There are, on the other flip, um, managers who, 29% um, of the managers said they had a negative effect. And so looking um, lower level positions on repatriation, um, company did not manage to keep them, zero benefit. Um, international experience discredited, um, lost, you know, all home country contacts, you know, et cetera, um, other effects, um, being now in a more risky specialist area, more power driven, being away from new ideas and developments, psychologically very tired after the assignment, like lack of energy. Um, I want to mention there is an updated version of um, the one resource and there's a special chapter in it they've added just for managers who are coming abroad representing their companies and the importance of keeping in touch with headquarters and how to better improve and avoid some of these negative experiences so 
looking at self-reflection and knowing yourself. And the truth is that we must be self-aware enough to gain a perspective about ourselves. And this is very important. Um, we need to identify and speak to our skills, our experiences, what motivates us, and what it means to our next employer, if that's one of our aims. Also, living abroad, you become more sensitive to your own culture. I mean, you become more aware. What to expect, um, a stereotyped American, and I'm, I'm speaking as an American because there's also, I'm half Italian, so there's also stereotype of the Italian, but, um, you know, what to expect. This is an old photo from Dwayne Hansen. He did a whole series stereotyping the American. And we know um, all over the world, people think they know us. I mean, they've watched American films, TV programs. They've heard incredible stories from friends and relatives who have visited the U.S. And for sure, their incomplete view of us is as dis a distorted one. So you will be um, confronted with stereotypes. People will judge you not on the basis of who you are or the signals you give off, but on the stereotypes that you formed. And there's lots. Um, some of them are too close uh, to home. Um, but for example, you know, we're always considered optimistic, outgoing, friendly, informal, loud, rude, boastful, superficial sometimes, politically naive, and the list goes on. I mean, to us, many of some of these stereotypes are positive, but to others, they may be negative. So my advice here is to resist becoming angry or defensive and avoid fitting into some of these negative stereotypes and persist in being your, your genuine self. I think, I think that's really important. When I look at culture, and what can I say about culture? We know culture. We know our own culture. Um, in short, culture refers to the total way of life um, particular groups of people um, have. I mean, it includes everything that a group of people thinks, it says, does, makes. It's a system of attitudes and feelings. And culture is learned. It's transmitted from generation to generation. So um, in short, it's the way of life and it's embedded in us. And I can't emphasize enough, even some of the values. I mean, we remember the old proverbs, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness or a penny saved is a penny earned or don't cry over spilled milk, you know, looking at practicality, thriftness, cleanliness. Um, also, it's, it's not whether you win or lose, but how you play the game for good sportsmanship. I mean, there's, you know, all different values of us, persistence, etc. And we have all of our um, cultural um, issues there. So um, I'm not a cultural trainer, but I did um, add a, a tool that is very interesting and useful. And it brings a little bit more awareness, you know, to cultural differences. Um, there are, as we know, there are clearly differences in culture. And if you can identify them, you could manage them more appropriately. So um, this is a um, chart, Klunhan and Stodbeck. Um, they looked at cultural differences based on five key orientations with five questions. And this was looking at um, human nature, relationship to nature, the sense of time, activity, and social relationships. And as an example, I just put in middle class mainstream Americans. So looking at the orientation and the beliefs and behaviors. For example, human nature, we're, we're basically good feeling optimistic. Um, you know, there was, I mean, this is going back, Will Rogers, he was an American humorist. He once said, I never met a man I didn't like. I mean, this is, you know, we're very positive in this respect to human hate nature. When we look at relationship to nature, you know, we think, um, you know, there's clear separation, you know, clear separation. Um, sense of time, we have a strong task goal orientation. For activity, we're very action oriented and social relationships 
We're very individual. Um, equality, informal, we call people by first name, outgoing, um, extroverted. When we look at the Japanese side and the Japanese orientation to the beliefs, in human nature, they believe there's good and evil. Um, their relationship to nature, they're in harmony with nature. Their sense of time is past-oriented as well as future-oriented. Their activity is stressed on self-development and stress on action. And their social relationships are very authoritarian, very top-down, and they're group-oriented. And this is really very important. So, you know, when we experience another culture other than our own, we experience conflict dissonance and disorientation and it's always the result and getting through this experience is like white water acting you know it's exciting it's rewarding but it has shawls and rapids um, i will say that people who have a preference for variety um, difference and like a lot of different choices in their lives seem to adapt a little bit better um, it's obvious that we need to develop new skills, uh, different ones from which our culture provides um, while you know, or provided while we were growing up. Um, these are cultural shock. It happens, as I mentioned, and phases of adaptation. So, you know, you have the honeymoon stage, you know, where you're really excited and then you go into culture shock. I mean, the moods, they change from positive to negative, maybe, you know, a little bit in between. Then there's the recovery and adjustment. Um, a nice, um, a nice um, uh, chart or slide that I like is the cultural shock triangle because it really looks at the dynamics. You know, it looks at the emotions, the thinking, your social skills and identity. And we really, or, I mean, if you're thinking of coming abroad, I mean, you need to think differently. I mean, from stereotyping to culturally effective thinking, you know, your emotions from euphoria to depression to contentment, looking at social skills and identity, you know, from national to transnational skills and then international identity. So it's really, um, trying to bring it all together and to come closer, you know, you know, moving to, to be more centered, you know, to deal with the, the culture um, issues. Um, how to deal with cultural shock. I mean, learn about cultural shock and don't be caught by surprise, you know, expect it. Identify all opportunities, you know, support groups. There's so many different expat support groups. Learn from previous managers. Um, give yourself time to adapt and don't rush into too many projects. And the company should be aware of that too. I mean, it generally takes about a year, you know, overseas before you really start feeling, um, you know, feeling, you know, a grip on things. You know, seek professional help if you have symptoms that per persist. Um, think about positive aspects of cultural shock. Retain a sense of humor. Um, other things are learn everything you can about your host country, learn a language. I mean, there's different ways. You know, also what I was mentioning, um, you know, it's life balance, you know, get involved. I mean, that's, that's important. Talking about perception, this is, I don't know if anybody um, can identify, but if you were to look at that slide, what do you see? I don't know if you want to mention it in the chat. It's also to keep you awake. So um, I don't know if you're looking at that picture, if you can just mention what you see in that picture. Do you see a woman? Do you see an old woman, a young woman? Perception, um, you a lady in a hat, okay, both young and old, young woman. There's young woman with a hat, okay. 
they generally say um, if you're young you'll see a young woman if you're old you'll see an older woman and if you are a man you might see a younger woman that you want to date so anyways that's uh, a little take away from the perception i just wanted to to share with you because perception is at the heart of intercultural communications um, Deep down, we assume that under normal circumstances, we think and perceive the world in the same way. And that um, whatever I say, that the other person will think the same. And this is far from the truth. I mean, we misperceive, um, we misinterpret, we misunderstand each other all the time. And this is with the same, um, with the same uh, culture. So can you imagine another culture? You know, so we have to think about our perceptions and they play tricks on us and we are selective in what we perceive. When when you're in a situation where everyone perceives something in ways you don't, you feel stupid, which can be pretty depressing. And this is actually a normal um, a normal feeling. And I suggest that get used to feeling stupid sometimes and um, not to think, uh, not to think too much. I wanted to share with you um, to give you a little, um, a little uh, uh, about the international teams. You know, challenges of international teams. There is always excessive stereotyping, a need to understand each other's culture better, a lack of openness and communication. Um, and the culture factor was seen as an overused excuse for not being able to get the job done. This is an example of the perceived differences between US and British teams. And I know there's a lot of British and US um, crossing. And for example, the British teams thought Americans were too directive, too aggressive, too fast, uh, focusing on the possible, but not thinking about obstacles, and cowboys shooting from the hip. And the U.S. thought the British teams were too consensus-driven, too defensive, quality rather than quantity-oriented, very bureaucratic, um, focusing on negatives, their long-term planning um, required longer implementation, and they, weren't, they were risk-adverse. Um, they took too many holidays and having shorter working days, um, inflexible and sluggish. So um, I just wanted to share uh, this with you, and which is interesting. Um, now I'm going to, you know, we, we talked about um, my international experience, culture, culture shock ways to adapt and the importance of communication and challenges. And I'll move to the job search strategies. Um, I think all of you would agree that the job search has changed radically over the last 20, even 30 years. I mean, it was really simple. I mean, there were ads in the local paper where you just matched your skills. Um, the job search was generally restricted to a certain city or region, and you as a candidate competed against local applicants to the region. I mean, talent pools were smaller, where you could you know, work with three or four recruiters and have several job offers. I mean, the, special, the specialized were still specialized, so that didn't change very much. I mean, today and yesterday, specialized. But you wrote a letter or made a phone call and if the employer liked you, the job is yours or the interview. And the process was much shorter. Today, it's much more broader thanks to the internet and career sites and aggregators. Um, job postings are easy to find. And of course, we have LinkedIn. And don't forget all the global companies with their websites listing their positions. This sounds like a good thing, but it's actually a problem. Um, everyone can apply for a job anywhere, even if that person is not remotely qualified. Um, candidate pool is larger because technology has enabled recruiters to identify more talent in locations, and generally people are more mobile 
than in the past, which means they will relocate for the right opportunity, making location not the limiting factor. So keep in mind that companies have more candidates to choose from and can be more specific about the requirements. And that means that you have to be more specific about your requirements to be successful. And I look at this as the right path and where success feels easy. I mean, I call it the sweet spot. So when we look at, you know, what I like to do, you know, what I'm good at and what the world needs, I mean, what value you add um, to others. And um, I want to say that Michelle, um, Michelle Rapp is an excellent resource. I mean, if you need help, you know, with coaching or, you know, you're having some challenges with your um, job search, um, it's really, it's really important because you have to understand where your passion is. You have to understand where your purpose is. Um, you need to understand what you're good at and how you can add value for others. Um, the next, you need to have a plan, and that's your target plan. So you have to look at geography, I mean, where you want to live and work, um, companies where you would like to work, and why, with specific attention paid to purpose, culture, and fit. Um, also looking at the roles and responsibilities, what you can do for the next employer, the value that you can add. I mean, this is really, really important. Um, you know, there are new career patterns that are emerging with the newer and younger generation of top executives um, with different backgrounds. Um, they're, they're more educated, more likely to have a university degree, often have advanced degrees, um, are more likely to have international experience, um, have worked for a larger number of companies, and they changed more often. And, um, it's really important, you know, to have a strategy. When you are applying um, to different countries, it's also important to adapt your application style to the style of the country. I, um, you know, after this slide, I've listed a number of resources. There is one resource, very interesting. It's called Living and Working um, in Respective Countries. It's Living and Working in Switzerland. They have Living and Working in Italy, living and working in the US. It's by David Hampshire, Hampshire. He has um, a whole series of any country um, that you're interested in working. It covers all aspects that you can think of. It's not a tourist guide. It's for people who want to live and work in the country. It talks about culture. It talks about applying for jobs. I highly recommend when you're deciding on your geography, your target location, you have your plan together, you know what you're good at, you know where your passion is, and you know where your value is, is to pick up one of these books. Um, adapting uh, the application style is really crucial. Um, you know, as, um, as I mentioned, I've worked in three countries, very different application styles. In Switzerland, um, it, everything is required. You have to attach um, copies of your academic and professional certificates. Um, it sometimes include references, um, you know, listing languages spoken. Sometimes there's a standard CV. So this can vary from country to country. Here are the resources that I mentioned. For example, I use, um, you know, now I have living and working in Switzerland. I have also living and working in Italy, living and working in Germany. Um, there's the survival kit for overseas living. Um, I had an older version. I've also read the newer version, and it has a new chapter for managers coming abroad and how to repatriate um, themselves and what, how to manage the headquarters, you know, from afar. Um, Breaking Through Cultural Shock by Elizabeth Marks, fantastic. Um, these are standard and classic um, references and still used today, some in the classroom. And then a friend gave me Lose the Resume, Land the Job. Um, Gary Bern Bernison is um, the CEO of Corn Ferry. I think he's still the CEO of Corn Ferry, I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, really interesting stuff and also talks about um, the globalization and the importance of a global 
um, experience. And of course, my classic is what color is your parachute? Um, and I use Career Confidential as um, she has, uh, Peggy McKee has a number of webinars, free resources. Um, also, I believe um, maybe Zanetta has joined us um, as another coach. Um, but, you know, really, um, there are resources out there. You can contact call consulates, embassies. There's a lot of international organizations. Um, Internet is fabulous. I mean, it's amazing the articles and research. I mean, I pulled up three or four new articles with new information. So I'm going to close it here and say best of luck to everyone and thank everyone for attending. And um, again, this was my first webinar, so any feedback you have. Um, if you want to contact me, um, if I don't answer your question, you know, here, I mean, we're going to have a little question and answer for any of you. But if you, um, if I don't answer your question, uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, it's christinemarie.lunardelli at gmail.com. I'm more than happy um, to help you in any way I can. I mean, that's, that's why I'm here. So thank you. Thank you, Christine. This is so much information. It's perfect and wonderful. And I'd love to open it up to um, the attendees to type in any questions. And there was a question about, from an earlier slide, what does low goal or t low task orientation mean? Oh, low task orientation is um, you're actually at your, you're not at your performance um, performance level. And for example, many women, you know, they come over and they want management positions, but they end up taking task oriented or um, lower level positions than they're qualified for. So it's um, um, also task oriented is, is when you, um, you know, it, you're setting objectives and then you have the tasks that go to a, achieve those objectives. Great. And we have a question about health insurance. Anything that people need to know? Health insurance varies in every country. And again, I highly recommend living and working guides um, because it covers specifics in each country. For example, in Switzerland, I have to pay for my health insurance. It's required by law. So there are several different insurers that you can choose from. So for example, I have Spica, which is one of the um, insurers here, and I pay monthly, and we get to choose the types of plans, but we have to have some basic coverage. Italy has universal um, coverage, so I hold a, an Italian passport. So, um, and also if you have a permesso soggiorno, um, you might have to, to buy some um, insurance in Italy. I'm not sure. Um, I would double check that because the laws change frequently. Um, but generally, um, they, they care for patients and you can pay out of cost. You know, for, they have a small private and then they have um, universal uh, insurance. Germany also, you have to pay. You have to pay for insurance monthly. It's required by law. So every country is different. I was curious, Christine, from your experience, you know, if, if something stands out as a challenge that you faced at work related to and being able to be effective in your role and how you made the shift. No, it's, uh, there's been a lot of challenge um, <laughs> living abroad. Um, I, I have to say the biggest challenge is getting the experience when you don't have the experience. I mean, that's, that's a given. So, um, you know, even in the U.S., I think it's the same way. Uh, I remember when I was trying to get in sales. I mean, I was trying to get in sales, and um, I was final candidate, final candidate. And when I asked them, you know, why I was not hired, they said, well, you don't have sales experience. So I went out and got sales experience to someone who liked my um, skill sets. And then I called the person I wanted to work with um, back up and said, hey, I have sales experience. I want to come work for you. And they hired me. And I once told that 
experience in Europe, and they said that that would never happen in Europe. <laughs> but in any case, um, it's really the challenges have been, um, you know, getting the experience. Um, it's been challenging. Um, also, um, teams, you know, and developing those skills that I had in one of the slides because um, I was very um, goal oriented, results oriented. I didn't have some of those skills, um, you know, dealing with ambiguity, you know, um, being more flexible, adaptable, you know, um, Europe and Europe and U.S. are very different markets, and it's much slower here. Um, there's also less transparency, so you're going through, um, you know, the challenges are less transparency, getting experience, working with cross-functional teams, um, because you really have to have empathy, and you have to really understand um, what each person can contribute, and how you're going to work together. So, um, you know, it's it's been it's been challenging because you know in Italy you work with Italians, in Germans you work uh, in Germany you work with Germans, um, in Switzerland you work with Swiss. However, um, it's also I'm in a very international community at the moment, and um, and I saw this evolving um, over my years abroad. Um, because as people became more mobile, the teams became more cross-cultural, and you saw um, more flexibility. So um, I think it's developing those skills, Michelle. Um, mm -hmm. um, not being afraid to fail. I mean, there's no such thing as failure here. I mean, I don't look at failure. Um, you know, in the States, I, I had more sensitivity to it, but, you know, here, um, it's trial and tribulation, it's learning, um, and getting better at what you're doing, not to stop learning. I mean, that's that's really the key, you know, keep adding skills. Um, Thank you. Uh, we have something from Patricia. Okay, it disappeared on me. <laughs> okay, it says, um, there's just a shift or rift both in the U.S. and Europe. How does that play out day to day in work environments? Maybe it varies by country and culture, as you were saying. Um, can you repeat that, please? Sure. Um, there's such a shift or rift both in the U.S. and Europe. How does that play out day to day in work environments? I don't know if that refers to a political shift within the country. Um, I can say um, I can say that I mean the political um, definitely plays in. For example, Italy, um, you know, it's a challenging market, um, Italy, and um, you know partly because there's not a lot of growth, um, people are not mobile, um, they don't move frequently. So most um, Italians go overseas to get career progression. Um, I, I think I've been, I was fortunate. I went to one of the top schools there. And also, I, you know, coming from the U.S., my American um, skill sets and background helped. But also, um, on the flip side, um, you know, it was hard to integrate. You know, I think after I had the, you know, obtained my Italian passport and also was able to speak Italian because that's my second language, it helped. Um, Great, thank you. Answered. You know, if I didn't answer your question, please send me an email. Um, okay. So. I'm also just adding to the list so people know um, the Career Center here under their online resources has something called Going Global, which also has similar to what um, Christine mentioned, but these are country guides as well as it has information about employers and the approach to the job search and resume differences. Um, so you're able to look at a country guide based on where you might be conducting a job search. I would highly recommend knowing as much as you can about the country that you're targeting, your host country, and having really good reasons for motivation. I mean, 
I mean, right now with globalization, it's so easy to have you know, an assignment abroad. Um, I was talking to one of my US friends, her niece just came to, um, she was going to Columbia University and she just came aboard um, abroad um, to Bern, uh, Switzerland, and she did uh, a month, you know, abroad. Um, you know, there's month, three months, six months. I mean, there's all types of opportunities. Uh, I, I, and you know, if you network, um, you know, LinkedIn is fantastic. I mean, use your your link your your networks. I mean, you can network and you know, find someone that can steer you in the right direction. Also the embassies, the consulates, um, there's so many, I mean, if you're in Boston, I mean, I don't know where you are located, but Boston, I got in touch when, this was 20 years ago, in touch with the international community there. It's so incredible. Um, and they have events and you can start networking and, and before you know it, I mean, I was talking to alumni and getting on a plane and coming over and meeting them before moving here. Um, I did, it took me over a year of research and you know, it's not an easy decision to, to come abroad. I mean, it takes a lot of courage and a lot of legwork. So, um, but it's worth it. I mean, it really is. Well, that seems like a positive note to wrap up on. Christine, I really appreciate um, the, the amount of thought um, and information that you put into this and the amount of research and information that you shared about lots of different aspects of living and working overseas. And your experience is impressive and inspiring as well. So we really value your willingness to share your expertise with us. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, there will be a recording of this session made available as well. And we Hope to see you at future webinars. Thank you again, Christine. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everyone.